song. Kind of, I kind of chuckle though when that's the offertory. You know, burdens are lifted at Calvary. You know, and lift the burden off you and put it in the plate. Amen. But uh, I shouldn't tell you how my mind thinks sometimes. That's dangerous, isn't it? All right, Acts chapter two for our scripture reading tonight. Acts chapter two. Thank you, Lisa. Acts chapter two. We're going to read verses thirty-seven through forty-seven. 37 to 47, reading them responsively, begin together on 37 and alternating reading till we end together on verse 47 of Acts chapter 2. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture, all of us standing to read God's word, and let's begin together verse 37 of Acts chapter 2. Ready? Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this evening. We thank you, Lord, for the word of God and for the privilege that we have copies of it in our hand tonight. Lord, we pray that each one of us would be prepared to give our careful attention to your word tonight. Uh, it's been a wonderful service already, Lord, and I, I appreciate the, 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 the sensing of the Spirit of God uh, in this place. Thank you for people who love you and for people who love to sing praises to you. And Lord, I'm praying now that you'll make our hearts ready to receive your word this evening and the truth that you have for us tonight. Bless the special to that end. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> How long has it been since you talked with the Lord and told him your heart's hidden secrets? How long since you prayed? How long since you stayed on your knees till the light shone through? How long has it been since your mind felt at ease how long since your heart knew no burden can you call him your friend how long has it been since you knew that he cared for you how long has it been since you knelt by your bed and prayed to the Lord up in heaven. How long since you knew that he'd answer you and would keep you the long night through. How long has it been since you woke with the dawn and felt that the days 
worth a living. Can you call him your friend? How long has it been since you knew that he cared for you? Can you call him your friend? How long has it been since you knew that he cared for you? Amen. That's good. Thank you, Bob. Our Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer now tonight. We ask you to open our understanding tonight as we come to your word. I ask, Lord, for your help as I bring the message that I would say what needs to be said and the way it needs to be said. You keep me from saying anything I ought not to say and from saying anything in the way it should not be said. Pray the Spirit of God, you would be our teacher tonight, that you would minister to the people of God in this place as only you can. So help us tonight as preacher and people alike. And Lord, allow us to leave in a little bit saying it was good to be in the house of the Lord this evening. So have your way in these next few moments. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts, as we talked about this morning in the passage we looked at in Acts 19, is a transitional book. And from uh, those who were living prior to the church age to those who would be now living in what we call the church age, Primarily, God has been dealing with His chosen people, which is Israel. And when Jesus came into His own, His own received Him not. And uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sense in which God has set aside those people. He has not abandoned His people, but He has set aside those people and He is focused right now on His bride. That is the church. The gospel has come to the Gentiles. That's you and me. And that's what most of your New Testament deals with. Once the church age is finished, and that is when the rapture of the church takes place and the Lord Jesus returns and we're caught out, God's attention again will turn towards Israel. That's why that tribulation period, that seven years of tribulation, is called the time of Jacob's trouble. God is once again going to be dealing with His people. The tribulation period has nothing to do with you and me. Uh, the believers, as the bride of Christ, will be caught out. That's why we're a pre-tribulational rapture church. Uh, I believe the Bible teaches we're caught out before uh, the wrath of God comes upon the world. And, and there's many scriptures about that. I'm not, that's not the message of this evening. Uh, but here in Acts 2, we read about the day of Pentecost, which uh, most of us understand and, and we know that this is when they were endued with power from on high. They were filled with the Spirit of God and they preached with great power and great boldness that day. And as you know, they, they were able to speak in other tongues. Now that is an unknown tongues. They were speaking, if you think of the word tongue, don't just think of what our modern day uh, gibberish uh, it tends to be. But think of, uh, the word, think of the word languages. There were uh, many different nations represented there in Jerusalem. And the amazing thing to the people was we heard every, they, heard, they said, we hear every man speaking in our own language. They, they heard the gospel message in the language they were from. Uh, our our Spanish-speaking friends would uh, say they heard it in, in Spanish. Uh, the Portuguese folks would say we hear it in Portuguese. Uh, the German folks say we hear it in German. And they heard it in known languages of that day. And what was the purpose? For them to hear the gospel. For them to hear about Jesus Christ. And on that day, we find that 3,000 of them accepted Christ. 3,000 of them were baptized. And 3,000 of them added to the church. It was a pretty amazing day. But Pentecost was not just supposed to be, a, I think, a one-time happening. I think that was an example day of what, what, what could... Hey, do you think if we, there was anybody who would meet for 10 days and pray and seek to be endued with power from on high? 
And, and we had 120 that would unite together in one accord to ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to proclaim the gospel. Do you, do you think God would not want to do that again? You think God could not save 3,000 people and see them added to the church? Oh, I believe God could do that. I don't think the problem's on God's side at all. I think the problem's on our side. I think we, we, don't, we don't... When's the last time you ever heard of a church have a 10-day prayer meeting? Uh, we, we have a hard time with churches having one prayer meeting, let alone 10 days worth. And, and, and 120 of them meeting every day in one accord in one place. It was amazing. Now, the sermon recorded in Acts 2 is Peter's sermon. I don't think that there was a big crowd and, you know, Peter stood up with, with a microphone and big speakers and he preached a message to thousands of people. Uh, I think that, that all the 20, I, I believe all 120 scattered out preaching. That's how all of them heard it in their own language. And it, it uh, you know, it wasn't a United Nations meeting where they all put on headphones and they all could get interpreted, okay? And uh, they all spread out. They were all winning souls. They were all, when they added it up and tallied it at the end of the day, uh, they had, uh, had 3,000 saved of those 120. Now, but the message that's recorded for us is Peter's message. And, and it's, it's simple, it is Christ-centered, it is pointed, and it demanded a response. By the way, that's always the four characteristics of a good sermon. All right, it's simple, that means everybody understands it. It's Christ-centered, it's centered on Jesus Christ. It is pointed, they were pricked in their heart. You're not going to get pricked, there's no point to it. Sometimes I've sat in a, in a service and, and thought, what's, what's his point? I uh, hope you never have to worry about that when you listen to me preach, but what's the point? And then it demanded a response. They said, what are we supposed to do? He said, here's what you do. And he tells them what they need to do, and they had to respond to that. That's called the invitation, okay? And uh, that's always important. Now, I want you to look at their response. I said, I want to talk to you about response and responsibility, okay? Response. Notice what he said. Verse 37, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart because he just told them in verse 36 that they took the same Jesus whom you crucified. God's made him both Lord and Christ. And when they heard that, they were pricked in their heart and they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. They were told to repent. <clears throat> now, you must repent in order to be saved. But you must believe in order to be saved. Well, what do I do, do preacher? Do I have to repent to be saved, or do I have to believe to be saved? Yes. Okay? That's the answer. You have to do both. And, and it's, there's no, listen, and what, the way to understand this is this, there's, there's no repentance without belief in Jesus Christ. And there's no belief in Jesus Christ without repentance. They, it, it's, it's like if I gave you a quarter and said, now you, you show me, uh, you know, that, that one side is heads, the other side is tails, but it's only, it's still the same quarter. You're not going to have a quarter. If you've got a quarter with two heads on it, you don't have a good quarter. You've got a quarter with two tails on it. You don't have a good quarter. It, two sides of the same coin, they always go together. When one is mentioned in the Bible, the other will be implied that that goes along with it. Now, uh, and, I'll, and I'll show you that. Just, in fact, they, look at um, two places I want you to look. We'll come back to Acts 2, so don't lose your place there. Stick a piece of paper in there or something, all right? Or uh, take one of your fingers off and lay it in there, all right? But uh, go to... Go back to your left to John chapter 3 and then Luke chapter 13. Okay, John 3 and Luke 13. All right, if you got those two, you say amen. Okay. Let's look at Luke chapter 13 first, okay? Then we'll flip over to John 3. In Luke 13, it says here, verse 1, there were present at, the, at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. 
And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you nay, but except ye, what church? Repent, you'll all likewise perish. So Jesus' message is repent or perish. Now wait, he doesn't end there. He says, Are those eighteen upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all the men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So the message is repent or perish. That's what he's teaching and that's what he's preaching. But you go to John, in John chapter 3, most of you know this, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever repenteth... Oh no, wait a minute, it doesn't say that, does it? No, it says, For whosoever believeth in Him should not what? Perish but have everlasting life. So, in in John 3 and verse 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Okay, so is it believe so you won't perish, or is it repent so you don't perish? Yes, it is. See, it's both. And it's implied in both. You can't have one without the other. Repentance, and this is what, what, what you have to understand, Repentance literally is a change of mind. I don't know. When, when you're witnessing to someone, uh, it doesn't matter who they are, everybody has something they're trusting in that they think is going to get them to heaven. Whether it's their good works, whether it's their church, whether it's some, uh, any number of things. Now, and, and by the way, just, just as a side note, when I witness to someone, and, and I ask them if they know if they died, they go to heaven. And if they say yes, I don't say, what are you trusting in to get you there? Because if they say, I'm a good person, and I say, well, good night. Being a good person isn't going to get you there. Now, they've stated their position. I've stated my position, and we're going to butt heads on. Okay? Here's what I found out. I found out that people are much more likely to change their mind if they haven't already verbally stated what they believe. And so what you do is when they say, yes, but you have your doubts that they really are saved or that they really are certainly trusting Christ, then I say, well, I'm glad. Uh, I don't run into many people that say they're certain about going to heaven, but I'll tell you this. If anybody was giving out a guarantee about heaven, I know you certainly wouldn't need my guarantee, and no offense, but I wouldn't want yours. But if God was giving out a guarantee about going to heaven, I sure would want to know what God says about it, wouldn't you? Well, sure. Well, you know, in the Bible, here in the book of Romans, and I go to the Romans Road and say, God gives us four things that he says if we'll understand them and believe them, we can have his guarantee of going to heaven when we die. And I'd like to share that with you. Now, I begin to go through the plan of salvation, and I begin to show them that the, the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ, that it's nothing we do, it's not our works, it's not our church, it's that all, we, all, all that we do, we fall short. We're still sinners in the sight of God. That's why Christ died on our cross. And they begin to think, hey, I'm wrong. I, I, I can't do anything good to go to heaven. Jesus died for me. He died for my sins. I think I need to trust him. I think what he's telling me is true. And the Spirit of God deals with their heart. You know what they just did? They just changed their mind about what they should trust in to take them to heaven. I won't trust in my good works. I won't trust in my church. I won't trust in what I've done. I won't trust that my uncle's a preacher. I'll trust Jesus as my Savior. They repented and put their faith in Jesus Christ. See, I don't know at what point they changed their mind. I don't know at what point, but the way you got saved was you had to change your mind. You had to change your mind and agree with God about what the Bible says the way to heaven is. Repentance is changing your mind from unbelief to belief in Christ. Whatever you're believing in before, saying that's not right, I need to put my faith in Jesus Christ. That's changing my mind about sin and changing my mind about the Savior. So we understand that repentance and faith always go together. Number two, I want you to remember this, sorrow is not repentance. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. This is just, uh, this, is, this is something you need to know, okay? I know this isn't real exciting for you, but it's something that I think is, is you ought to know and understand. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. This is part of that doctrine 
that you need to learn, okay, and study to show yourself approved, all right? And uh, you, you may need this later on in this message, as a matter of fact, so you just listen carefully. Look at 2 Corinthians 7. Paul is writing now to them, and he says in verse 8, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it, were for, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. Somebody can be sorry, but not be sorrowful to repentance. To changing their mind. Sometimes people are sorry because they were caught in what they were doing. And they're really not sorry about what they were doing. They're sorry you caught them doing something. Okay, and, and any parent understands that. He said, But I am um, that ye sorrowed to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. So sorrow leads to repentance. But sorrow isn't repentance. And, and there's, there, there can be a sorrow for what's been done, what you've done wrong and a sorrow for sin, and that's good. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're ready to turn from that sin. But it can lead to that. You want to pray that they'll have godly sorrow that will bring them to changing their mind about their sin. There are no steps to salvation. Salvation is instantaneous. Salvation is immediate. You put your faith in Christ, it's immediate, it's done. You are saved. Uh, you're passed from death unto life. It's a, it's a transaction, and it's completed, and it's a miraculous thing. It's just a miraculous thing. Then, I want you to look back at Acts chapter 2. Because here's a verse that, that, that many stumble at. And, and those who want to add something to salvation like to use. And I want you to help you understand this tonight, all right? Baptism follows repentance and faith in Christ. Notice, Peter said to them, they said, what shall we do? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Now that's a, that's a verse that anyone who's church of Christ, if someone's in the church of Christ, they believe that not only do you put your faith in Jesus, but you must be baptized also in order to be saved. And the verse they look at is this verse. Is they want to use this verse and say, see, it says repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sin. And obviously the key word here is that little word for. F-O-R. All right? Now, it, it can mean uh, in order to, but that isn't what it means here. Think about it this way. It means on the basis of or on the grounds of. So in other words, if you look at that, you say, I'm, you're repenting, and we know repentant and belief is the same thing. So he's telling them to believe, repent, and, and put your faith in Christ. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ on the basis of your remission of your sins or on the grounds of your sins have been forgiven. In other words, I can scold people for being late for being late on the grounds that they were late. See, I'm scolding them on the basis that they were late. I had to, uh, I had to scold a couple of our young fellas this morning because they weren't singing during the song service. They were talking. And by the way, they were singing tonight. They did a great job. Amen. And I appreciate that. But you see, I didn't do it for them in order for them no, I did it because on the basis of what they had done. Quentin, I can say Quentin was arrested for stealing. He wasn't. He got away with it. No, he didn't. But he, he was arrested for stealing. In other words, on the basis of stealing or on the grounds that he was stealing. Do you understand how the word for is being used here? So they're baptized on the basis of or on the grounds of their repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Now, if you, if you doubt that at all, you always take, whenever you come across a scripture in the Bible that you're not sure about, you always interpret the unsure in the light of the sure. Does that make sense? 
You, you take the, the difficult and, and interpret it in the light of what, what does other scripture say. The best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. And you compare scripture with scripture. Now I want you to look at Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. And when you get Mark 16, go ahead and I uh, want you pick up 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Mark 16 and 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Aren't you glad you have a Bible? 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and Mark chapter 16. We'll go to Mark 16 first. All right. Notice Mark 16, verse 15. He said unto them, that's Jesus speaking, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Well, there it is. You've got to believe and be baptized to be saved. That's another verse that those who believe, what, what they call that when someone believes that you have to be saved but also baptized to go to heaven, they call that baptismal regeneration. In other words, you're regenerated. You're regen the Bible talks about how you're washed with the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Really, it means you're regened. Regeneration. You get new genes. You get, what do we get? We become partakers of the divine nature. And they say you're regenerated, baptism. In other words, baptism is essential to salvation. And they want to use that verse to prove it. But wait a minute. Does the verse stop there? Oh, it doesn't. Okay, let, let's finish the verse. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. What damns you? Oh, not believing. He didn't say, but he that is baptized not shall be damned. He says, he that believeth not shall be damned. It has nothing to do with your baptism. It has everything to do with your believing, whether you're damned or not. Okay? Now, let's look at 1 Corinthians. Chapter 1. The church of Corinth had their division, their schisms, if you will. And they were divided over preachers. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of, I'm of Cephas. And then you had the real spiritual ones who said, I just follow Jesus. I don't follow any man. Okay? And they were all divided. So Paul is trying to trying to help this, and he says in verse 10, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. This I say, every one of you saith, I'm of Paul, I'm of Paulos, I of Cephas, I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were ye baptized in the name of Paul? Now watch. I thank God I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say, I baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now, if baptism is part of the gospel by which you must be saved, then Paul didn't understand it. Because he said, I'm here to preach the gospel, not to baptize. So how can baptism be part of the gospel? It cannot. The gospel, which he declares later in the epistle in chapter 15, is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, that's the gospel, and let me help you, that's the full gospel. I'm going to ask you, are you a full gospel church? Yes, we are. We believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the full gospel, all right? So, so that's, that's the response. Listen, response is repentance towards God and faith in Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith in Christ, and then baptism follows that. We dealt with that a little bit this morning, all right? Now, let's look back in Acts chapter 2 and look at the responsibility. This was their response. They believed and they were baptized. And now they had a responsibility. Listen, this new church, quite amazing. They had, they had nothing that we considered to be essential for a new church plant today. You ever think about that? What's the first thing usually when a fellow wants to go out and start a church, uh, brother, in fact, the, the Cato's just planted a church on the mission field. And uh, 
First thing you want to do is, we need to find a building. We've got to find somewhere to meet. They didn't have a building. They didn't have a PA system. I don't know if they had chairs. Uh, they, didn't, uh, they didn't have hymnals. Usually you say, well, we need chairs, we need a place to meet, we need a PA system, we need some uh, song books, we need, you know, and things we think we got to have to conduct a service. They didn't have any of that. And, and, and they had, for, for pastors, they had, they had foolish and, and uh, are ignorant and unlearned men. Well, you may have that one. But we don't have the others. I mean, they in this church ran thousands before they ever chose any deacons. Pretty amazing thing that took place. Amazing work. But these believers had responsibilities. Can I help you understand something? That being part of a local New Testament church has responsibilities. We don't like that much anymore. I was talking to somebody recently and they go to a church here in the area and he was talking about the pushback they were having at church because the pastor is, is concerned about the members caring for each other and, and understanding their responsibilities to each other and he has passed out basically like a membership covenant that he wants them to sign. That as a member of this church, I will abide by this. I will do these things. And boy, people are balking. Whoa! Whoa, I don't want to do that and having a hard time. But listen, I just want you to know, I'm not going to ask you to sign anything tonight, but I'm going to tell you there are responsibilities that each of us have as believers. <clears throat> Let's look and see what, what, what he has them do here. These, these folks uh, got saved, verse 41. They that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So first thing they did was, after they believed and were baptized, they became part of the church. They joined the church. They were added unto them, added to the other believers. And they, listen, I think they're saved and baptized and belonged all in one day. That's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. No, no waiting period. No, no signing them up for a 12-week new, new member class before they let them be a member. And, and, and listen, I, 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 I'm not... I, I'm not some churches do that, but, but you can't be consistent about that. You say, well, I want, if some believer comes forward and says, I want to be baptized. Well, you take our six-week course on baptism. But I wonder, and then you can get baptized. But I wonder if they come up and say, I, I need to start tithing. Do you think they say, well, you need to take our six-week course on tithing, and in six weeks you can get? Or do you think they say, make that check out to funny how that doesn't work they don't have to have a class on that part of it do they <laughs> just give it and I'm, I'm 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 making a little bit of fun but listen it, it it you can churches do that but wait is that is there a bible precedent for that there really isn't the bible way was they were saved they were baptized and they belonged and they they learned what it was to be in church and listen they the, the best follow-up program for a new Christian is to be in church. Just just get in your mind, when I'm saved, I'm going to be in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. In fact, anytime they say the doors are open, I'm going to come. I'm going to be there. And you'll grow. God will open up things in your life, and you'll begin to blossom, and God will bring about changes that you won't believe. The importance of the church. And so I think it's the best discipleship course you can have. Just be faithful to church. So they joined the church, number two. We'll move through these quickly tonight. Number two, they, they learned doctrine and had fellowship. Verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Doctrine is Bible teaching. They continued how? Steadfastly. Boy, they were determined, they were set, they were the clockwork, they were going to be there. And by the way, that's why every time the church comes together, we hear the Bible. Because you're coming together for doctrine. For what? For Bible teaching. This is where you grow. Desire the sincere milk of the Word that you can what? Grow thereby. You grow on the Word of God. We go, it goes with what we said this morning. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. If somebody said, well, why do you believe in the virgin birth of Christ? 
Did you take your Bible and explain that to them? Well, why is it that you believe in the uh, blood atonement of Jesus Christ? Did you take your Bible and explain that to somebody? But uh, if, they, if they ask you to explain why you believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God, could you take your Bible and explain that to somebody? Or would you have to be at a loss? See, they were, they were continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's, that's doctrine. Explain to me the, the purpose and the role of the Holy Spirit in your life. Could you take the Bible and show some scriptures on that? Do you understand how we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God? That God gave us this book? Because listen, doctrine and, what's the second word? Fellowship. What comes first? What follows? Fellowship. Our fellowship is based on our doctrine. A fellowship is based on those having common Bible teaching, common Bible beliefs that you have. Sometimes today, people want to just, let's just fellowship because we love Jesus. That's not the basis of fellowship. Fellowship is a base of what do you believe doctrinally? What do you believe about Bible doctrine? That's what our fellowship is based on. And that's what our, our, our companionship, that's what fellowship is. It's a companionship. If doctrine is not the same, you cannot have close fellowship. It's impossible. Fellowship is companionship. So my companions have to be around those who have the same Bible teaching as I've had. That's the basis of our fellowship. If someone does not believe that salvation is by grace through faith alone in Christ, how do I have fellowship with them? Our doctrines don't agree. You understand? It's a pretty major difference. That's why, that's why I, I don't just join the local ministerial association with people who don't believe in the virgin birth or people who don't believe in the inspiration of the Bible or don't believe what? Our doctrine doesn't agree. How can I have fellowship when the doctrine's off? It's doctrine and fellowship. They go together. So your best friends, your companions, aren't going to be the people you work with during the week. They're not necessarily going to be the people in your neighborhood. Where, where should your companions come from? They come from your church. Why? Because doctrine. See, those are the ones who you become close to. Those are the ones you begin to fellowship with. That's what they did here in the early church. Their doctrine and their fellowship. You know why? Because belief determines your behavior. What you believe determines how you behave. If someone doesn't behave right, it stems back to what they believe in their heart. And so you have to believe right to behave right. And so it's doctrine and fellowship. So they, they joined the church, being part of the church family. They learned doctrine and fellowship. Number three, they observed the Lord's table. It says breaking of bread. I believe that's a reference to the Lord's table. It also could go along with the fellowship. But the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the juice, the observing of the death and the burial of the Lord Jesus, picturing the body and the blood of Christ. And whether you have the unleavened bread and you have the, the, the juice, the fruit of the vine, uh, it can't be wine because that's fermentation. That's leaven in the wine. And, and that would be sin in the blood of Christ. You can't have that. See, that's not our accurate picture of the blood of Christ. Same way with the unleavened bread. And, and so you're picturing the body and the blood of Christ that was given for us on the cross. Jesus said, as oft as you do it, that you do it in remembrance of him, in remembrance of his death, and we do show his death till he comes. And so they observe the, the Lord's table, and we do that at church. And then it says, not only in breaking of bread, but in prayers. In prayers. They understand now there's something they need to be doing when when they, they have problems or they have needs, there's a new way to approach it. You know what the new way is? Prayer. You know, lost people, only if there's some dire emergency or some awful tragedy do they ever think about praying. 
And usually it's crying out to God to make a deal. God, get me out of this and I'll... And they'll promise whatever they need to think they need to promise to get out of their situation. Some of you, before you were saved, you maybe prayed prayers like that. God, just help me get out of this and I'll do this and I'll promise you I'll... You hear, some, you hear some of those kind of prayers in the emergency room of hospitals where they, they're crying out to God. But most of the time, unsaved people don't pray. When there's a problem or a difficulty, they'll say, uh, they, they, they'll, by the way, they'll go to the bottle, they'll go to a pill, they'll go to a psychiatrist, they'll go to some other, they'll do anything, but they don't think about praying. But now that you're saved, you pray. In Jude, when it talks about building up yourself on your most holy faith, the very next phrase is praying in the Holy Ghost. As you build yourself up in your faith, as you're growing in your new faith, you know what you begin to find? You find out that you need to pray. And not only do you need to pray, you have to pray. I know, that's, 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 that's harder for us in America. Brother Dave mentioned something Wednesday night, and... Um, uh, talking about his time in India there. Do you remember what he said? He said, those people pray all the time. He said, because they don't just have little, they have nothing. So they must pray about everything. What's our problem? We have everything. We don't have to pray, give me this day or daily bread. We just have to open the cupboard and say, what do I want to eat today? Open the freezer and say, okay, what, what choice of meat do you want now? Hmm? And, and when, when we have that, we don't pray, but we don't realize something. Without me, Jesus said, ye can do Part of the Laodicean church age is when the Laodicean church says, I'm rich and I'm increased with goods and I have need of nothing, including prayer. We talked earlier about the prayer meeting that started Pentecost. Don't churches have prayer like that? Because we got our buildings, we got air conditioning, we got nice seats to sit in. What are we praying for? See? But God says the way that you receive things as a believer, what God is desiring is we look to Him to take care of our needs. God, God may, you know what? God may not want me to eat what's there in my cupboard. He may want me to give that to somebody else. He may have me do something completely different. But I'll never know that if I don't ask Him. I never know that if I don't pray. So prayer. Why do you think Jesus said men ought always to pray and not to faint? Pray without ceasing. You have not because you ask not. You see, there's something different now as a believer. I, we're not just living to see what we can do. There's, a, there's an opportunity to pray. And talk to God and see what God can do. To see God supply our need. Most of us don't come to church and say, man, let me tell you what God did for me this week. You know why? Because we didn't ask Him to do anything for us this week. Except very general terms. God bless us today. God, give us a good day today. Well, how, how do we know if that happened? You see, we have to be specific when we pray. Wouldn't you like to see what God could do? Wouldn't, it, wouldn't you just like to be involved with something sometime that you say, man, look what God did. I mean, it'd be something so great and so amazing that people would look and say, well, it could have been those people who did that. That had to be God. That's what we're looking for. That's what this happened in this early church. As this church, historians vary. But, but the, on the low side, they say in six months, this church had about 60,000 members. On the high side, historians say it could add 100,000. People who wrote during this time that this church was exploding in Jerusalem. Do you think people looked at those 
those disciples that Jesus picked and said, yeah, we figured those guys would do a great work. No. They looked and said, man, that has to be of God. And it was. It was amazing. So they joined the church. They learned the doctrine and fellowship, the Lord's table, prayer. And then verse 44 and 45, you find out they learned to give and give joyfully. It says, all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. You see this again in chapter 4. If you look in chapter 4 at the end of the chapter, it says in verse number 34, uh, Acts 4 verse 34, Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Need arose in the church. They met the need. Somebody had goods or possessions. They sold it. And, and they gave to the apostles. And the apostles distributed to the people who needed it. So the church, that's what I said before, when people are a part of a church like that, you know what? You don't need the government taking care of you. Never was the plan that the government would take care of people. You know why? Churches took care of their people. When people left the church and left the house of God and left and didn't want anything to do with God, now we've got to rely on government to take care of us. But that was never God's plan in the first place. And this isn't, this isn't mandatory. This wasn't somebody, this isn't any kind of communism here. They gave as every man had need. Somebody had two coats. Somebody said, hey, this guy over here doesn't have a coat. It's okay, give him one of mine. Can't wear two. Most of us, most of you can go home tonight and open a closet in your house and there's any number of coats and jackets you have to choose from that you could wear depending on how cold the temperature is. Most of us have, have enough coats and jackets we can layer up and have about three of them on if we want to. All they said was, I don't need to, I'll give one away. Somebody has needs. And they did it happily. They did it joyfully. Somebody had a need, they took care of it. You see, they, 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 they gave out of a love to meet the needs of others. You know, it's a great day when you learn it's more blessed to give than to receive. It's a blessing to give. And, 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 and listen, you do well in this area. Give to to help folks who are uh, in, in the homes and giving to Emily who are going to do, to do an internship on the mission field and the way you give to missions and the way you give to help others. Things that, that, that most people in the church don't know about but I hear about. People who come up come on t today who said, you know, if someone uh, needs help going on the Mexico missions trip, let me know. They're going to help pay their way. You see, that's, that's what was going on in the book of Acts. People who just enjoy giving and enjoy helping somebody who has a need. And so that's giving joyfully. Then num notice number six, back in Acts chapter 2. Notice verse number 47. It says they were praising God and having favor with all the people. Praising God. You know what they did? They learned to give thanks to God. They learned to just praise the Lord for what they were given. Hey, look at their life. Now they're saved. They have eternal life. They belong to a church. They belong to a group of believers. They're, they're learning the Bible, Bible teaching, doctrine. They're having companionship and fellowship with other believers who believe like they do, who exhort them and encourage them. They have the Lord's table remembering what Christ has done for them in the death and His burial and uh, His resurrection for them. They're giving to meet the needs of others. They're not, they're not trying to just, you know, get all I can get. No, they're, they're learning to, to live for others. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. They're learning to live that way. Why wouldn't they praise God? Man, that's the way to live. That's the kind of life you live to give praise to the Lord. What a life that is. 
And then they're praising the Lord that they've been saved and they have a church and they have a Bible and they're learning the Word of God and they can give to other people and, and they can praise God and God's doing a great work in their life. Hey, I know what they were singing. They were singing, It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Now, I don't know they were singing that. That's really not in there, but I'm just... That's slave ology there. That's not Bible ology, all right? But it was they certainly were rejoicing. And then... Number seven, notice the last thing there. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. They were winning others to Christ. They were witnessing to everybody. What were they doing? They were just doing what somebody did for them. Somebody told them. They listened and heard the word of God, the gospel preached to them. So what did they do? They said, I better go tell somebody else. You got saved because somebody told you the gospel. Somebody told you how to be saved. You ought to go tell someone else how they can be saved. Acts 5 and verse 42 says, Daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Daily they were preaching Jesus Christ. Daily they were witnessing for Him. And the Lord added to the church, Daily such as should be saved. Can you imagine that? Can you? And by the way, if they were added to the church, they not only had to be saved, they had to be baptized. You ever think about what would happen? As I was, I was meditating on this, I was thinking, I wonder what would happen if we just said, listen, let's take the next seven days and everybody, whatever time you have when you're not working, go soul winning. I mean, just take some tracks and go out and try to lead somebody to Christ. If you see somebody saved, bring them right down to the church. Call me up. I'll meet you at the church. We'll baptize them. And just do that every single day for seven days in a row. What would, you ever heard such a radical thing? There goes that. Thanks, Sheriff. Hey, you know what? That's, what? that's what they were doing. That's what they were doing. They, they, how do you get added to church daily? You were, had to be saved, baptized, and added to them. That's what happened in verse 41. That has to happen again in verse 47. And God said that happened every single day. Wouldn't that be something if, if somebody would attempt that? Oh, that's pretty radical. Yeah. You know I'm thinking about it. You know that. <laughs> I want you to know. Can you do that for a week? Can you do that for a month? Did you do that for a year? Wonder what God would do. God, God always responds to what we do for Him. You draw nigh to me, God says, what will He do? I'll draw nigh to you. God waits to see what we want to do, and He'll respond to that. Daily, the Lord added to the church. What an exciting place that was to be. What's the response? Repent, believe, be baptized. Responsibilities, join the church, learn the doctrine, have fellowship, observe the Lord's table, pray, give joyfully to meet the needs of others, praise God, and witness to others. That's our responsibility. Okay? Response and responsibility. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth here this evening. Thank you for this wonderful, wonderful church here in Jerusalem that we've looked at tonight. Thank you for what you did there at Pentecost and in the early days of this church. These are the men who just ten days earlier had seen you rise and ascend back to heaven. They knew what you wanted. They knew what the commands were. They obeyed you, and you worked in a marvelous, wonderful way. And Father, I pray you'd help us to understand the response that people have when they get saved, but then understand our responsibilities once we are saved. And I pray, Lord, that there'd be a group of people at Bible Baptist Church who would say, I sure would like to see 
what God could do through a group of people that are yielded to him and in one accord in one place. Father, speak to our hearts today. I trust you have. May holy decisions be made for you this evening. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. wonder how many folks here tonight would say, Preacher, I realize tonight my responsibility. The responsibilities I have as a believer. And preacher, the, the Spirit of God has pricked my heart tonight about my responsibilities. And with God's help, I want to fulfill my responsibilities as a believer in Jesus Christ. Preacher, God spoke to my heart tonight. Here's my hand as a testimony. Would you pray for me? Would you slip your hand up right now, Christian? Yes. Amen. That's good. Amen. Praise the Lord. You may put them down. Maybe here tonight and would say, you know what, Pastor, I'm not sure that I've ever responded to the gospel. Never put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior. Never have changed my mind about what takes me to heaven and put my faith solely in Jesus. But I'm concerned about it tonight, Pastor. Would you pray for me? Would you slip your hand up and just say, pray for me, put it back down, and I'll, I'll see it. Is there someone like that? God bless you. God bless you. I feel real impressed tonight to say, I wonder how many folks here tonight would say, you know, preacher, I need to, I need to learn doctrine. I need to be able to take my Bible and show people what I believe about the Savior, about salvation, about the, the, the doctrines of the Bible, the teachings of the Bible, the inspiration of the Bible. I need to know what I believe and I need to be able to take the Scripture and prove it. And the Lord has really convicted my heart about that. I really do want to study to show myself approved unto God. Pastor, pray for me that I'll be able to do that with the Lord's help. Would you slip your hand up, Christian, and say, that's me? Yes. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may put them down. Father, I thank you for speaking to hearts tonight. Lord, I pray that you would help each of us now to respond to what you've told us to do in our heart. I pray for your will to be done in each heart and life. Help each of us not to resist you, but to yield to what the Spirit of God has dealt with our heart about. And Lord, hear our prayer that we make at the altar this evening. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. She plays where the Bible sing. <clears throat> Lord has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this evening, will you? Oh, to That's right. Jesus I surrender. All oh, to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him. In his presence daily live. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender, humbly at His feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Oh, to Jesus I surrender, make me Savior, holy Thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit, truly know that Thou art mine. I surrender all, I surrender all. Oh, 
seated for a minute, if you would, tonight. Um, 